But why do speech sounds change at all? That they do, well, we know, because otherwise we wouldn't have different languages, okay? I mean, the development of languages is just mostly due to the fact that uh, sounds change differently in various parts of an area, whatever you like. And then languages, first of all, dialects, and then languages develop from that. So yes, uh, speech sounds do change over time. Why is that the case? And there is a simple answer to that, and this is here. Simplification. Uh, simplification is the main driving force behind language change. And why is that the case? Because we tend to reduce articulatory effort, which means we, uh, we hate uh, moving our speech organs, predominantly our lips and our tongue. Okay. Um, we regard this as an effort. I mean, moving the tongue back and forth and back and forth, or something like that. Yeah. And uh, or up and down, or uh, rounding your lips, or something like this. We don't like it. Okay, so people tend to simplify the effort uh, they take in producing a particular speech sound. Uh, some kinds of simplification um, I would like to mention here. There are many more. But just by way of exemplifying that. Yeah? Assimilation is certainly one of them. Assimilation means making two sounds more similar. Well, it's, it's clear. I mean, if uh, uh, two sounds are more similar, you need less movement of your tongue, for example. Okay? So, um, take an example. U and E, U, E, they are a lot more different than E, E, E. Yeah? For A, you don't have to move your tongue much, okay? But for OOE, you have to move it a lot. Uh, here's a, just a simple example, yeah? Uh, take the Latin word in possibilis, which means not possible. In possible becomes impossible because M and P are pronounced the same, basically. Impossible. Yeah? Impossible, impossible. Okay, impossible is easier than impossible. And this would be an assimilation, making the two consonants this time, yeah, n and p, more similar by having a bilabial nasal for the bilabial plosive instead of an alveolar. Yeah? Okay, two bilabial sounds are very more, more similar, okay, and therefore assimilation. Okay, uh, cluster reduction, this is easy. I mean, if you have consonants, clusters, we, we don't like consonant clusters a lot, which means consonants clashing. Yeah, something like this. Okay, German has more consonant clusters than English, for example. Yeah, Strumpf, oh, what a terrible word. Yeah, so you have and umpf. Yeah, uh, uh, the English don't like that. Um, Nobody does. Yeah? And you tend to reduce those clusters by just simply cutting off one consonant, for example. Yeah? Take this one here, Old English, yeah? Retan, Retan. Okay. Well, the first sound, the balabial, yeah? senior vowel, if you just leave it out and you arrive at Retan, right later on. We still spell the W thing. Yeah? Okay, we still spell it, but we don't pronounce it anymore. It was pronounced once, but that we don't do it anymore is just, it was elided. Way of, this is class cluster reduction. Okay, right becomes right. Okay, easier. Huh? Or take something like Knorwe becomes Knorwe. No, huh? you still spell the K. It was pronounced once, Kn. Huh? And today you say no, so cluster reduction. Okay, uh, lenition, making sounds more soft. Yeah, of course, there are sounds which are hard and hard to pronounce, and some sounds which are softer and need less effort. Yeah. Take this, it's a common example here, lenition. We call this softening. Yeah. Pater, okay, it's the Latin or the Indo-European root. It's pater, and it becomes father. What's easier? Pater, where you have to blow up your... Uh, you blow up your uh, your cheeks and then explode in a bilabial plosive parta. Okay, also father, father, father. Okay, for f is certainly easier to pronounce f than p. Okay, so p became f. 
far, and then the ter became the incidental fricative. Uh, pata father, father, father. Uh, father, you can pronounce just like this. Father. Okay, pata. I have to do quite a lot. Okay, uh, this we call lenition. Okay, softening of sounds. So making a p into a f is a lenition, making it softer. Okay, you can hear that. Uh, vocalization, yeah, that exists too. We will talk a lot about vocalization in this course. Um, uh, something like walk, yeah, becomes woke, 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 and then later on walk. Yeah. And uh, this is a major driving force. You have this in loads and loads of languages. Okay, L vocalization, most of all in Fra French. Uh, French, we have it quite a lot. Okay, castel, castellau, chateau, chateal, yeah, something like that. Okay, so yes, a, a few things I just want to say is these are all kinds of simplification which have left their mark on the language or on languages. And uh, there are others too. Um, and they are all due to simplification. Okay, simplification. And that's that. Okay, but there must be a counterforce to simplification, all right? There must be a counterforce. Otherwise, I mean, you would simplify and simplify and simplify. And in the end, I mean, everybody would end up saying something like, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Something like that. Okay. Still, of course, uh, it's easy to see what the counterforce is. It's intelligibility. Now you have to be understood still. Okay. So you can simplify. Uh, but, I mean, when you're not understood anymore, okay, um, then... Um, you have to stop, okay? Although French didn't, in a way. No, they went on, okay? Mm. No. But anyway, um, uh, um, sometimes you want to be better understood, and that's the other thing, yeah? This exists too, so the counterforce to, simp to simplification would be intelligibility or improving intelligibility, wanting a, a, a serious wish that you want to be better understood. I mean, look at this. These are a few examples here. Old English, yeah? Hund, hund, hund. Very short. And it, this turned into Middle English into something like hund. And there you see, hund yeah, is very, it's, it's easier to, to be listened to, easier to be understood. Particularly, we probably talk about great distances. Ooh, yeah, that's the hund. Yeah, something like this. Okay. Instead of, what's hund? Well, then it's gone. Yeah. So you lengthen. Okay, you lengthen at times uh, so to make yourself yeah, more intelligible, if you like, yeah, understandable. You know? uh, various examples. Yeah, you still in German you still have Hund short. In English you have Hund, and then later on Hound. Okay, long. Yeah? Feld. Yeah? Felt. It used to be very short. Felt. Okay, as in German. Felt today. Felt. And then field. It becomes field first of all, and later on field, or Takan. Uh, today, ta take, taken, be takan became taken, lengthened, okay, because takan is so short, short you it just slips by, just like that, okay. But um, if you lengthen it, probably you stand a good chance that people will understand you. So, yes, there is a counterforce of simplification. It's uh, the keeping up or even the improvement of intelligibility. Okay. Um, once again, uh, this, uh, 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 I said this before, yeah, so the subject matter of this lecture will be to explain the incongruities of English that still bug us today, okay? There are a few others, um, but um, uh, a few more, but I will not refer to those, yeah? And therefore, we will do a reverse chronology, okay? So going back to things which happened relatively recently and then go back to things that are more remote and more remote as far as time is concerned. Okay, um, and uh, therefore I would like to start here. Uh, the development of modern English vowels. And why everything seems to be so messed up. Yes, modern English vowels are messed up. But, but, well, at least if you compare it to other European languages, okay. Um, I, I talked about this before. So why is that the case? Yeah, that uh, uh, any European, if you saw the word time spelled, would automatically pronounce it time or something like this. Only the English say time, okay, with a diphthong. All right. 
And uh, uh, but, but before we do this, we have to get a few things straight. Yeah, and how are vowels um, being classified? Uh, what is a vowel? Okay, uh, there are two properties um, of a vowel. Two properties a vowel has, and those two properties are very much sufficient for English. Uh, has more properties in other languages. All right, nasal, for example, something like this. No, uh, 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 it's a quality and quantity, okay? And quality means where is your tongue in your mouth? Uh, this is the difference between i and e. I have a different quality, okay? I and e, but the same quantity because they are both short, okay? I, e, both short, short quality. Yeah? Uh, short quantity, sorry, um, but the quality is the same. So quality is just where is your tongue? Is it e, e, a, o, e, o? Tongue is moving here, okay? Or is it long or short? Okay, and this brings us to something which we call the great vowel shift, because in the great vowel shift, uh, everything was messed up, if you like. Uh, um, happened 400 years ago, okay? Um, and uh, this was a development which concerned the long vowels, and therefore we have to talk about quality, okay? Because only the long vowels were affected. And this is the thing which meant, made team into time, okay? The great vowel shift. And this is the, if you like, a development which is comparatively recent, only something like three, four hundred years ago, okay? Which is just yesterday, if you like, which is responsible for a lot of uh, strange things, let's put it like that, in English today, okay? And I would like to come to this great vowel shift uh, in the next installment in detail, okay?